All right. So um, I want to start the, our discussion of seasons with some poll questions again. So coming back to the idea of Earth's orbit and the shape of orbits, which we talked about last time, um, what is the shape of Earth's orbit? So yeah, Earth's orbit is, it is elliptical, but it's very nearly circular. So the difference between um, the perihelion and the aphelion, the closest point and the farthest point, is only about 3%. Of the, of the total um, of, I guess, the average distance of the orbit. So it's almost a perfect circle. So um, that means that we can't really explain the seasons by how close or far away the Earth is to the sun. So this orbit is actually shown with the correct eccentricity. Um, and there's, there's just not enough uh, difference in distance to the sun to explain the seasons based on proximity alone. And it gets worse because the actual point of closest approach happens in January, which is our winter. So it, it just doesn't track to explain seasons um, using the distance to the sun. Okay, um, so instead we're looking at other factors that might influence the seasons. So here's a poll um, based on this image, what season is it in Eugene? So yes, in this image, it would be summer in the northern hemisphere. So instead of the distance to the sun determining the seasons, it's actually the axial tilt of the Earth that determines the seasons. So uh, if we look at all of the you know extreme positions, I suppose um, when the northern hemisphere is you know in the position in its orbit so that it's tilted most towards the sun, that's when it's summer in the northern hemisphere, um, as opposed to when the southern hemisphere is tilted closest to the sun, then that's when it is winter in the northern hemisphere and southern in the, uh, sorry, summer in the southern hemisphere. Um, and then the equinoxes are special. So during the equinoxes, neither the northern hemisphere or nor the southern hemisphere is tilted toward or away from the earth. So they're actually receiving about the same amount of sunlight. Okay, so to figure out why this axial tilt um, affects the seasons, uh, we're going to have to look at two specific factors. So let's explore these also with a few poll questions. Um, so there's some special locations on Earth, just like there's special locations in Earth's orbit. And the ones that I'm going to focus on are the equator. So that is, you know, between our two poles. And then there are two special locations called the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn and the Arctic Circle and Antarctic Circle. So I'll get into why all of these are special in a minute here, but based on just looking at this image, what would you say is the location of any of those special locations where the sun would be seen directly overhead on June 21st, being the summer solstice? All right, so most of you are saying B, the Tropic of Cancer, which is totally right. And I had trouble visualizing this just looking at this image. And so I found it helpful to think of myself as an observer on all those locations and draw a line looking straight up, right? And if I do that, then that's what, uh, you know, straight up looks like to an observer on all those locations. And you can see that it's the um, observer at the Tropic of Cancer who, when looking straight up, is looking directly towards the sun in this image. All right, so that's what it means for the sun to be directly overhead at that location. And this is true for the Tropic of Cancer on the summer solstice. It's then true for the Tropic of Capricorn on the winter solstice. And the equator is where you see the sun directly overhead on each equinox. All right, so um, here's what it would look like for that observer at the Tropic of Cancer on June 21st. So now I'm leaving my earth untilted just to fix my point of view here. Um, and the sun is now coming in from um, the north. So if you kind of, you know, just shift your head, you can see that the sun, it, you know, the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. And so in this case, my sun beams would be pointing directly down toward the ground. And so why does this actually affect the season? We have to think about what is the intensity of the light that's hitting the ground at different angles. So here what I'm doing is saying, let's suppose that I take a one meter squared cylinder of light 
and only that amount of sunlight is allowed to hit the ground, but I can point it at any direction, right? Based on where the, um, you know, where the sun is and where the observer is. So in that case, just thinking about these three spots of light, each of them has the same total amount of light beams in it, but which one would be the most intense? Okay, yeah, so I'm seeing mostly C and that's right. So the, the most direct light is the most intense light. And you can kind of imagine like if I had, um, you know, there's the same total amount of light in this spot. And if I thought, you know, instead of just visible wavelengths of light that it was infrared or heat wavelengths, then this spot would become the most heated, right? Uh, this spot would become the least heated because that same amount of energy is spread over a wider area. So if I was just looking at one square meter, then this square meter would be cooler than this square meter in C. All right. Um, so there's the same total amount of energy, but it's spread over a very large area in B compared to C. All right, so this actually does have an effect because that's exactly why the earth gets warmer and cooler at different amounts or different times of year because the light from the sun heats the ground. And it's a little bit more complicated than that because there's also what we call thermal inertia. So, you know, if you put on a pot of water to boil, it takes time for it to actually reach its temperature. And the same thing is true of earth. So the sun starts to heat the earth more and more as we approach the summer solstice. Um, but because of that thermal lag, the hottest day of the year isn't generally on the summer solstice. So here in Eugene, it ends up being like early August is the hottest part of the year. Okay, so another question. Let's say that we're at the summer solstice, June 21st. Um, where would an observer in Eugene see the sun? So um, north of the celestial equator is totally correct. So here the celestial equator is marked in green. And if you were in the Northern hemisphere on June 21st, as we're seeing here, then the sun is north of that celestial equator for you. Okay, so here's a little bit of an illustration of how the, sun, uh, how the sun's path changes over the course of the year. So on the equinox, it follows the celestial equator. And um, then when you're looking in the summertime, the sun is farther north of the celestial equator and in the summer farther south. So if you were gonna look at the sun and kind of track it as it um, traversed the year, then it would make a north, north to south motion. All right, crossing the uh, celestial equator for each equinox. Okay. So here's what that looks like for the applet that you can play with, with the observer placed at 44 degrees north latitude. Um, so you can see that uh, you know, the, the sun dips in the winter, rises higher toward the north in the summer. So we talked about the sun heating the ground more directly when the light beams are straight down. But then when you're looking at the sun being farther to the north, then you can notice that the arc that it makes across the sky is bigger, right? Meaning that the sun is actually up for more of the day, which you've obviously noticed that the days in the summer are longer than the days in the winter. And so not only is the light more direct, but also there's more time for that heating to occur during the day. Okay, so those are the two factors and they're both influenced by the axial tilt. 